Hey, everyone. Uh, so as uh, Kelsey mentioned, I'm Spike Curtis. I'm a core developer with Project Calico. Um, I've done some work for a number of years uh, with networking uh, in general, now container networking with Project Calico. Um, and I also spent some time uh, deploying large applications into secure government networks. So this is going to be a talk that's mostly about network security and a little bit about Project Calico. So um, the, the thing that I, uh, I want to say is that there is a bit of a problem with, uh, with microservices and Docker and, and this crazy world of containers in terms of network security. So I want to talk about that for a while, but also mention that, that there's a real opportunity here and, and not just an opportunity in the sense of like there's a problem and if we solve it, uh, someone's going to pay us a bunch of money. But um, we actually have an opportunity to uh, make our applications more secure than they were before microservices and before Docker. So um, if you think about uh, like the, the kind of history or, or, or how people build applications today, and this started and was popularized in the 90s, we have these N-tier applications where the canonical N is three. You know, you've got um, your outer layer, which is presentation, or in modern days, it's always the web. Uh, you've got your middleware or app tier or your business logic. And then at the end, you've got your data tier or persistence. Um, this started off as uh, a way that people designed applications. It was an application architecture. But um, it has also become the way that we secure networks. So you build your tiers of applications, you put them into, or you did put them into a layer two segment, you built a firewall between them. Um, because really it was this data layer that was the one that was the most important, right? You did not want anyone getting their hands on your data. That's the keys to the kingdom, that's your customer's data. That's the thing that it's really bad if that gets compromised. So um, you build these uh, you know, outer layers as, um, uh, demilitarized zones and you variously get more militarized as, as you move in. And if this is sounding a bit, uh, a, a bit martial and, and a bit ancient, you know, it, it's sort of like a castle or, or a walled city, right? So you've got this outer wall um, and you mostly let everything in and out of that unless you're being attacked and then you close your gates. And then you've got the castle um, in the corner of the city uh, on a hill, and then inside that you've got the keep, and that's that's where the you know that's where the crown jewels are, where where you keep the attackers out of. Um, and uh, so that was the '90s. You know, um, if you fast forward today, you've got you've got this this architecture where you've got physical machines that are all perfectly replaceable. You got rid of all your old appliances. Um, you know, these things are are multiply redundant. You build virtualization on top of them, and then um, when it comes to the network. Uh, architecture. Surprise! It's the same architecture. Um, you still divide everything into, into these tiers and you build your data tier and that's where you defend and you put firewalls and they're not, they're not appliance firewalls, but now maybe they're software firewalls or, or some sort of virtual thing that, that you're spinning up. But, but the way that you demarcate your zones and you actually defend your kingdom is, is still by talking about these tiers. Now the problem is that, you know, when you start going to microservices, this, this is going to break down. So, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I was deploying a large application for a law enforcement customer, and, and basically the, the network security guy handed me a form that basically looked like this. He was like, okay, fill out your services. And I only had seven of them at the time, so it was not that difficult to fill out, but then, you know, I forgot one, and so he's like, okay, we'll raise a ticket, and then we'll open that port on the firewall. And then two weeks later, you want to add another service or another instance, and it's okay, we'll raise a ticket, and then we'll put that on the firewall. And this ticket thing is, is, is starting to get a little crazy, right? You want to add another service, maybe you want to deploy another whole application stack into that same environment, or another application stack. Um, and by the time you get to, to microservices, you've got you know, gophers everywhere and pythons chasing them. And like this complexity is coming. If you're, um, if you're, if you're in, in network security, like you, you have a choice, right? You can be like, no, I still want a ticket. I still want to review all of this change to my network security. And if you do that, then congratulations, you're now the bottleneck to inno innovation at your company. Um, or you can say, okay, well, I'm just going to let everything through now. So that's one problem, is this increased complexity. Um, another problem um, is this expectation 
of what I call resource fungibility. Fungibility means that, that things are, are perfectly equivalent. You can swap one thing out for another thing. And if you think about what Kubernetes is like or Tectonic running, you know, uh, this is the, the Tectonic API running on top of Kubernetes, the expectation was, we, you know, we heard this, your entire data center looks the same. Even if you take off Kubernetes and you go down to Fleet, right, Fleet says your entire data center looks the same. Um, or, or Mesosphere, uh, they're, they're here as well. The DCOS, your entire data, your entire data center is one, uh, is one thing that you deploy applications to, right? That's, that's fungibility, that's the dream, that's what you want. You know, this is not, this is not fungible. I've got, I've got these tiers and if I wanna move resources between them, now I have to change the scaling of individual things and, and you're, the, the, the speed at which you can do that is, is really limiting. So uh, it's not all bad news um, in, in terms of, of containers, right? Like you can, you can have everything living, living together and you don't have to pretend like it's just a zoo and you've torn down the walls and you're letting them all, all live together. Um, the, uh, the opportunity here is that microservice architectures actually have some really nice properties when it comes to security. Um, one of them is, uh, is compartmentalization, right? If somebody owns one of your services, they haven't taken over your entire application. Maybe they've gotten some of your data, but they haven't gotten all of it. You're keeping, you can keep things separated out. So, so an attacker has to be able to um, compromise a lot of your application in order to do a lot of damage. The other nice property is that um, containers uh, or, or microservices, you're decomposing your application into really simple pieces. And these are really easy to analyze or comparatively easy to analyze from a security spec perspective. It's a small thing, it does one tiny thing really well and it has relatively few inputs and outputs. It doesn't need to talk to everything in your network, it only needs to talk to a few things. And this is much easier to, to think about and reason about um, and say, you know, what, what is my attack surface for an attacker who's trying to move in through my network? Now, the, the dream here is, is that I can split up an application into these tiny microservices that are highly compartmentalized and isolate everything. Um, but obviously I can't, I can't make them completely isolated from the network, right? If I isolate them completely, that's just, I can pull the network cord out of the server. Now they're totally isolated on the network, but that's not any good. You need to punch small uh, holes through your, your firewall in order to allow your application to actually work. But um, those small holes uh, are, are really easy to figure out where they should be. It's easy to, to sit down and, and write down what is, what is a properly functioning application? What does it need from the network? So that's what we want to do. We, I, I, I think of this as uh, a distributed firewall. It's not a firewall that's separating tiers. It's not a monolithic application. This is a firewall that runs everywhere and isolates every single instance of every single service in your application. So how do we, how do we get there? How do we build it? Well, one thing you don't want to do um, is, uh, is port mapping. Um, this has been kind of brought up a bunch of times, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but, but I will just say, if, if you want to do network security, do not do port mapping because um, in the good old days, um, every application or every, every service had a well-defined port, right? HTTP runs over port 80. Um, and then recently we've gotten into uh, the, the not so good days where you do uh, port mapping on your hosts and now you can't actually tell what a service is by what the port is and you will slowly go insane if you try and uh, write a firewall that can uh, deal with this. So um, fortunately, you know, the good old, old days are coming back. Um, we are all gonna build containers that have one IP per pod or per service. Um, Kubernetes already does this. this. That's built into their architecture. Mesosphere is moving that way. Um, Project Calico supports this, which is uh, a networking fabric. All the other networking fabrics that you've ever heard of also do this. So the good old days are coming back. Um, one IP per service is the way forward. The other thing is um, if you want to build a distributed firewall, the place that you want to actually impose the rules on what that container does um, is right at the edge of that container because 
that's the place where you can say, oh, I know exactly what that, that container is supposed to do. It's supposed to talk on port 80 and it's supposed to talk on port 514. If you put it anywhere else, then you have to start munging all the rules together from a bunch of different containers and that leads to complexity that you don't want. Um, so, so the architecture here, and I've, I've put routing um, in, uh, in the container host rather than, than switches, which is what a lot of other people do because Calico is a routed network. So let's talk a little bit about um, how, how Project Calico actually works um, and then I'll, I'll do a demo of, uh, of Calico running this distributed firewall. So um, with all this uh, fast moving change, you, you need something that is automated that's gonna be dynamic. Uh, to set up your firewall, so you don't want to be doing this manually. So we have an agent that sits on all of your uh, uh, container hosts. Uh, it's called Felix. And what it does is it programs uh, the routing into the Linux routing tables. It programs the firewall into Linux IP tables. So this is the same architecture that we've known for um, you know, dozens of years. Uh, Linux routing, Linux net filter. Um, so where does Felix actually get this information? It uh, comes out of a distributed data store. We've chosen etcd. Um, that contains all the information about what endpoints are in the network, what services, what's their policy, um, and then Felix actually goes in and does the programming. So where does etcd get this information? That's gonna be from your orchestration layer. Whatever you're using to start up and run your application in the data center, whether that's um, you know, the dword uh, swarm, um, that might be CloudSoft with Clocker, it could be Mesosphere, it could be uh, Kubernetes, Tectonic, many, many others. But Calico works as a plug in there, so we take information uh, out of that orchestration system about what services you want to start um, and what their policy should be. That goes into etcd, beamed out to all of your compute hosts, and then actually implemented on uh, the hosts. I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking ab about routing just to kind of um, explain how Calico is, is different than some of the other uh, network fabrics for containers. So the routing information is just in the, in the Linux kernel. We route, we don't do overlays. It's, it's pure IP. Um, and to, in order to do that, in order to not use overlays, you have to distribute the routing information around so all of the hosts know where all of the containers are or which hosts they live on um, as the next hop. So we use BGP uh, to distribute that information out and you can use a route reflector or a full mesh of BGP sessions. Now, we could have put that information into etcd and use etcd distri to distribute that information out but we've chosen to use BGP instead uh, because BGP is an open standard protocol. Uh, we know how, it's, how it works. This is the protocol that basically uh, routes all the traffic on the internet. So we know this will scale. Um, and the other nice advantage of using BGP rather than etcd is that you can connect this straight up to your infrastructure. So if you've got routers in your fabric, if you've got edge routers, um, you can just connect Calico straight up to all of that equipment and now uh, that equipment just works uh, with Calico, we can advertise routes outside of your data center so people can connect in. Um, find me later if you want to talk more about, about routing. I, I mostly want to talk about firewalls and network security. Um, so, so the firewall rules, you know, because we've separated this down to the level of microservices, the firewall rules are actually really simple. Um, you know, if you've got uh, some sort of web front end, you don't need many rules to describe what this thing does because it's, it's supposed to be small and simple. So on the top, I've got three rules. First one says I'm gonna allow TCP connections on ports 80 and 443, that's HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Um, I'm also gonna allow ICMP so people can ping me, and then I'm gonna deny anything else for people making connections to me. And then I can specify outgoing connections uh, as well. So I'm gonna allow this guy to uh, connect on port 514 to uh, other containers in my network. Um, and uh, the destination tag here is just a selector for other services, other pods, other containers. Um, and Calico will, will expand that out to actually represent the IP addresses that are in, um, uh, that, that are dynamically allocated to the pods. So uh, it'll keep up with that as you bring up new syslog 
instances. So the, the tag you can think of um, in Kubernetes terms, that's just like a label. Um, in other orchestration systems, that might turn out to be something else. But it's basically just a shorthand for this collection of endpoints. And when you bring up um, a service, you tag it. All right, so let's do a quick demo of this. Um, what I'm gonna show you is uh, like the simplest network application ever. Um, it's going to be a Python HTTP endpoint running in Flask with just a single endpoint um, that's gonna take a message in and write it to Redis and then read it back out. So two containers, they're networked together. Um, the message box is stateless, Redis stores all the state. Um, this is just to kind of demonstrate how a network application would work, but the, the interesting thing is that um, I'm going to impose network rules on this so that my, my test um, probe, which is this net test container, that's just going to be an Ubuntu image uh, that has some network analysis tools loaded on it so I can actually show you how this works. Um, that's going to be able to reach the message box service uh, because it'll be configured to, but it won't actually be able to reach around and uh, look at Redis itself. That'll be prevented by uh, the policy that I'm going to set up. And I'll be able to do this without actually having to sit down and write firewall rules like I just showed you. Um, that's actually just going to come out of the pod specs. All right. So let's swap over. And I have to look down here to be able to see. So excuse me one moment. So I've got a Kubernetes cluster. This is slightly modified from stock Kubernetes in a way that I'll show you in one moment, but mostly it's just Kubernetes. So you see I've got some pods running. Um, Calico has its own etcd instance uh, just because Kubernetes doesn't like the minions actually connecting to etcd. Um, so we've got our own etcd instance. Kubernetes has it, its etcd instance, which is backing Kubernetes itself. And then I've got a DNS server running. So that's all that's running right now. And I've got some pod specs to show you. So the first one, it, oops, tab complete. So the first one is uh, this message box application. It's just going to pull down my image, which I built earlier, um, and uh, it is going to talk on port 5000. And what I, what we have added to Kubernetes, is this little allow from clause. So that says not just what port I'm going to open up for that container, but who's allowed to connect to it. And uh, the predicate of that is a Kubernetes label. So anybody in the stage uh, production is going to be allowed to connect to uh, port 5000 on this container. And for my other guy, that's oops. got a Redis container. Um, he's listening on 6379, and you'll notice that I'm not allowing anybody in that stage, but just the message box application is going to be able to connect to that Redis container. Um, so let's bring these guys up. I won't show you the YAML for uh, my net test container because it's not that interesting. And I also have some Kubernetes services, which is how uh, they're going to find each other in Kubernetes. That's just standard Kubernetes services so that I can access them over DNS. So it looks like actually all of my guys are already running. So I'm going to switch over to the minion, which I know is where all of these pods landed because I only have one. Um, and I'm going to do Docker PS and get my net test container just so that I can um, grab a hold of the container ID for that so that I can attach to it.
All right, so now I'm in this net test container. We'll check that the message box service is up and that it can connect to Redis. So I'm just gonna do a simple um, HTTP post uh, to that on port 5000. So a box is my endpoint um, and you can't quite see on this screen, but I've got a little bit of data message equals project Calico. So that guy res responds back saying it stored it, which means it can connect to Redis. And uh, then I will try get on that and it pulls up Project Calico, right? Stupidest web service ever. But um, now if I use Nmap, Nmap is a tool for port scanning, so I'm gonna use this to try and see what ports are open on these different containers. If I aim at the message box on port 5000, unsurprisingly, uh, that should come back saying, oh, port 5000 is open to TCP, which I told it to. Um, more interestingly, uh, if I look for port 6379 on that Redis service, See, that guy comes up as filtered. So the firewall has, has stopped this container from connecting to port 6379, but it's allowed my message box container to connect to it. And this is without ever having to sit down and like write firewall rules. Um, I just put this into the pod spec. So um, the way that, uh, like I, I wanna like tell you a little bit about what, what I hope the future looks like. Let's see, let's get back to presentation. There we go. So um, where we want to get to is, is being able to describe applications kind of in a natural way for developers, right? Something like this is, is the kind of thing that a developer writes um, on the whiteboard, you know, 100 times over the course of developing their application, right? This is just an entity relationship diagram. You write it, you erase it, rewrite it, and it's the kind of thing that's really easy to capture in something like a pod spec or a Docker Compose file or a blueprint or a container manifest, uh, depending on which orchestrator you use. This is something that, that doesn't change no matter where you're gonna deploy it. The only thing that's, that's different about a production deploy to a QA deploy or something like that is what's, what's actually external to this application. That's the person who's deploying this, that's what they care about. So maybe I, I say, okay, well the world is allowed to connect to my front end and everybody from the office is allowed to connect to this Cassandra back end to pull some stats and see how this application is doing. And then if I go to, um, to a test environment, the, the thing that's different here isn't all this application stuff, it's just the test. All right, it's just the fact that, well, only the testers are allowed to get to the front end, not the entire world. So you have this immutable bit of the network connectivity, and then you've got this external bit, which is saying, you know, who else in the world, who outside of my data center is allowed to talk to this application? Um, so if we can capture that into uh, the way that we describe containers and the way that we describe um, applications, then you can build these firewalls without having to actually muck around in um, instantiating different networks or different layer two segments and building your networks that way, right? We can do this automatically. So um, if you wanna get started with, with Project Calico, it's projectcalico.org. You can um, try out a demo uh, on Vagrant, which is uh, boots up core OS, lets you uh, play around with Docker and containers in Project Calico. Um, and we've also got, uh, if VMs are your thing, uh, a very mature implementation for uh, OpenStack. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll take some questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, uh, since etcd is, is uh, the place where you keep all of your policy information, you have to secure etcd, how do you keep that safe? Um, yes, th that's very true. You, you, you definitely have to secure etcd. Um, one thing uh, that is straightforward to do is just use TLS um, blocking etcd, or you can also uh, basically, in, in the way that you deploy 
uh, the firewall to each of the container services that come up. Since those guys aren't necessarily trusted, you can put rules into your firewall that, that say they're not allowed to connect to the etcd instances, right? So if they're in the container, I can easily firewall them off and allow the hosts to connect to etcd, and then probably also put a, a layer of encryption um, and authentication on top of that as well. And then you can make sure that uh, etcd is only able to be reached by your infrastructure, not by the applications. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question is, are there, are there performance penalties? Um, so IP tables is, is IP tables. It's the same IP tables you've, you've known and loved uh, for, for all your life with Linux. Um, so depending on how complicated you make your rules, those penalties um, go from being very insignificant to perhaps being very significant. The, the nice thing about doing this at uh, the level of individual microservices is that you can keep the rules simple. You don't have to have a complex policy, which means you can keep your rules light and fast, and you can do this without causing severe uh, slowdown or any, any more than negligible slowdown. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So instead of concentrating your firewall at the at the choke point between two different like layer two segments, this is firewalling every single container that shows up in your data center. It's distributed across, and you can customize it, it per container. Yes, exactly. Yeah, all all the policy lives in etcd. All right. Thanks.